Okay, let me just give a couple of uh, background here in terms of what we're going to be doing for the next hour. Uh, you'll see the, the sign CNN Marketplace Middle East. That's the show this uh, roundtable discussion is going to appear on next weekend. We're going to take a special look at emerging markets. I think it's uh, very fair to say if there is a, a chapter, a new chapter to be written here in Davos 2011, it's recognition that uh, the emerging markets have found their place in the global economy. Uh, let's take a look at the first graphic which indicates where we are today in terms of the role of emerging markets uh, in the overall economy and where we're going to be by the year 2030. So the year 2000, going back 10 years, about a quarter of the global economy was uh, generated from emerging markets. Last year, about a third. Uh, by 2020, 55 percent. And by 2030, uh, 69 percent. Now, a little bit later, I'm going to discuss uh, this period of history that we're in. It's a, a so-called super cycle, according to the research that we worked with with the International Monetary Fund and Standard Chartered Bank. Um, the first super cycle came in the late 19th century, which lasted for about 40 years. And we had the second super cycle after World War II, which gave us that industrial boost and in the rebuilding after World War II. And the third super cycle, according to Standard Chartered, started uh, in the year 2000. So we've had a lot of discussions here in Davos about the lowering of trade barriers through the Doha round and the introduction of the Internet and what sort of impact that would have on society. And this has, together, after the fall of communism in the 1990s, all come together as a perfect storm to unleash this growth in the emerging markets. We have some figures later showing the size and scale of the growth between now and 2030, which is quite mind-boggling. But one thing is for certain here, uh, the growth that we're going to see from Southeast Asia, the growth from China, the growth from India, the growth from Brazil and the rest of Latin America, and the renaissance that we're seeing in Africa today uh, is nothing short of extraordinary in terms of the, the, the growth. Global growth of 4% uh, predicted by the International Monetary Fund for 2011. It's pretty safe to say the growth that we're seeing in emerging markets for 2011 will be 6 to 8%. In some markets, uh, it's even higher. I had an interview with the Minister of Finance from Turkey today. He's very comfortable uh, with growth of 8% going forward, and the same thing with some of the economies we have on the panel. Now, if the dominant theme inside Davos 2011 was about emerging markets, it's fair to say the dominant theme, perhaps outside, was what was happening in North Africa. Something that hit Tunisia, spilled over to Algeria temporarily, into Jordan, and then finally imploded, uh, as we've seen in the last 48 hours, uh, in Egypt. I bring up this example because uh, they are all emerging markets. And most people say, well, we have very high jobless rates. What's happened there? Uh, that's true. But interestingly enough, Tunisia, Algeria, and especially Egypt, are all economic reformers. Uh, Egypt's been reforming its economy for the last five to seven years. But the other side of it, and which not often talked about, is that Egypt started that process in the early 1980s. Uh, President Mubarak started that process back then, and then when the heat uh, got a little bit too hot in the kitchen, he stopped the process, and it's come back to haunt him you know, 20 years later because the job creation and the trickle-down of the economy hasn't started. So I, I want to start this uh, discussion on what we've learned from the Egypt example. Uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, in her comments yesterday, if you were listening very carefully, she said, reforms are very important, but it can't just be economic reforms. It has to be societal reforms, institutional reforms, and most importantly, political reforms all coming together. And those other three at the end of my sentence there uh, were not in place in Egypt. And I'd like to start with Hala Janahi to say, if we see these emerging markets, uh, Egypt has captured in $47 billion worth of capital in the last five years alone. It's a market of 80 million consumers. Some of the best known brand names around the world all have a stake in Egypt because of the scale of the market and its trade agreements with the European Union and uh, some trade uh, facilitation agreements with the United States. What should we walk away with as a lesson uh, from Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria? You can't just rely on economic reforms alone. Well, I think that each of them is different than uh, others. But in Egypt's case, I think, as you say, it's 47 billion in the past five years. There's been a substantial amount of reform coming through. Uh, Minister Rashid is not here. I mean, he's been actually a catalyst for change in terms of reform that he, they worked on. But the problem is, when we look at the past 10 years, that the gap between rich and poor in a country like Egypt is widened so much. So people have gone either to the higher side or to the lower side. So what means the middle class is gone. 
That is where the successes were you learn from other parts of the South, be it Indonesia, be it Brazil, be it India, is the creation of the middle class. So if the middle class goes away, the backbone of any economy, you're finished. So you need, and there is a lesson, actually making sure that you create a middle class. And you cannot create middle class without actually having critical thinking, free thinking in a society and have entrepreneurship. So that is the lesson I would say that all of us we should learn. Mm, the two other uh, pillars of reforms, uh, societal reform, political and institutional uh, reform. Mari Pangetso, you said you had a similar experience in the uh, mid-1990s, and we had it uh, coincide with the global crash uh, in Southeast Asia, with the, the penetration of the emerging markets. What did you learn out of that process, and how long did it take to rebuild the reputation of the country? Well, as you know, after the uh, financial crisis uh, in East Asia in 97, 98, Indonesia basically went through a total transformation, uh, both politically, society-wise, and institutionally. And I think if you take the lesson uh, that what precipitated the political crisis in the first place, it is basically about, you know, when you can't have to uh, have uh, excesses, you can't have inequities, and uh, one of the big issues at that time was crony capitalism. Uh, and that, I think, what led to the downfall uh, of that regime. But it took us, I think, almost 10 years to really get out of it and, and come out uh, through this transformation journey that we've gone through. We now have uh, total democracy. We have direct presidential elections from the president to the village head. Uh, but economically speaking, it's taken, uh, I would say, you know, a good part of eight, ten years to really get to where we are now uh, with the sound macro policies and to get back to investment grade. Hopefully this year uh, we will get back to investment grade. So when something uh, catastrophic happens to you in the, your country, you go junk on, and then to go, get back up, uh, it takes you that long once you've shown that, you know, you've done all the reforms on your institutions. Mm. Tunisia and Egypt rely quite heavily, of course, on tourism receipts, and so does uh, Indonesia, less so now than it did in the past. This is clearly going to have a spillover in that sort of respect as well, wouldn't you say? For tourism, for uh, yeah, for I think it will have. A, well, we had a, we had a we had a, a, a dramatic effect on on tr tourism because of the crisis. On top of that, you know, for the last uh, years, we have also been having to deal with terrorism attacks, and that's also been something we've had to battle with. But I would say in the last three, four years, we've also been successful in overcoming the terrorist threats. Uh, not just by getting your intelligence in place, but at the, at the end of the day, poverty. Uh, we think poverty is partly uh, the root of uh, terrorism, including inequities, as well as education. Uh, so we've been addressing it at both ends, if you like. Um, Mohammed al Mahdi, I, I think a lot of people don't realize what the, the king has been up to in Saudi Arabia internally. We have the development of four economic cities uh, uh, happening at the same time. Uh, this is a, a way to open up the economy, but also to bring in foreign direct investment which, uh, believe it or not, hit $70 billion over the last uh, three years alone. Will there be spillover uh, from what we see in North Africa into Saudi Arabia, whether it's an economic spillover or even a political spillover because of the social networking and the social media? Uh, I do not think so. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is, is, is a country that is connected to the globe. It, we are trading with major trading blocks in China and India and Europe and the United States. We are... Uh, globalizing our uh, manufacturing assets all over the, the, the world. And uh, we are building educational institutes in, like King Abdullah University. So we are uh, spending a lot of uh, our budgets on education and innovation. And I think uh, my country is not going to be really influenced very much by this uh, spillover because we have a solid foundation on which the country is built economically and politically. Hmm. Is there a knee-jerk reaction to shut down or to open up as a result of this? This is a very sensitive subject in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. I would imagine. A knee-jerk reaction would be to, to dampen down information flow as a result of what we've seen happen in North Africa. I, I do not think so. You know, our, our country is open for business. You know, we have uh, been ranked as number 11 in competitiveness. So the country is really open for business, and we have attracted a lot of investment. Uh, <laughs> As a, as a result of the shift from west to east, and uh, we are connected to the rest of the global economy. Okay. Kazakhstan is a very interesting country, Mr. Kalim Batov, in a sense that it's got a, a vast array of uh, cultures, but it's a predominantly Muslim country. Uh, seeing what's transpired over the last two weeks in particular in terms of the importance of dialogue and the importance of political and institutional reform, what do you walk away with out of this uh, experience that we've seen 
in the last two weeks? I think uh, the main le uh, lesson is uh, maybe transparency of management in uh, our community. So uh, uh, President of Kazakhstan doing a huge program of political modernization. And I think uh, this is, means increasing the role of parliament, increasing the role of parties. And we are in these terms on the right way. And from the beginning, it's even called like a, a way to European values. And uh, you probably know that Kazakhstan was uh, uh, in last year hosted the OECE meetings. So it means that all these standards, which is usually uh, spread the uh, whole European community and other uh, CIS countries and countries in Central Asia. This is the way what Kazakhstan follow. But uh, what is the distinction of Kazakhstan among other CIS countries is, a, first of all, huge economic modernization. Uh, since uh, maybe, since got, we, we've got independence 20 years ago, we uh, started to uh, do economic reform. Uh, based on the uh, principle of uh, openness of the economy. And we've got, uh, we start uh, from uh, $400 uh, per capita, GDP per capita, and now it's more than uh, 9,000. And this is the second result among CIS countries after Russia. And I think it's a uh, way to uh, what my colleague mentioned. First of all, to create a middle class, which will be really protecting the future, all of its rights, and uh, we will need all of this freedom, which is uh, common. Mm. Minister Sharma, you have a, a you know, vast population of better than a, a billion people, and some near-term challenges, not just for India, but uh, another issue I'd like to get into afterwards is, is the threat of inflation and rising energy prices. But I've noticed the branding for India at Davos 2011 was inclusive India, not India everywhere. It goes back to Mr. Kelly Betov's point here about making sure this trickles down so that we have a... Uh, all members of society participating, and that's really rural India that we're talking about. That's true. We are just sharing at Davos what has been happening over the last seven years. It is an abiding commitment which the government and the leadership has to ensure that the benefits of our economic growth are percolated in every part of the country, particularly the hinterland, the backyards of the economy, the rural areas, the remote places, and also as the incomes are growing, as India has been able to move forward at a fast pace, creating uh, in the less than two decades a transformation of a kind. When we embarked on the path of liberalization in 1991, but we put our FDI policy in place in 1996. And if you look at these 14 years, it's a long journey that we have traveled. Today you have Indian companies, corporate leaders stepping out, major acquisitions and mergers worldwide. At the same time, India has an investor-friendly environment. But the growth model is different. It is driven by domestic demand and domestic production, not by exports. So now that is fundamental. The resource mobilization has also been primarily internal, though the FDIs has been substantial. But if you look at what, where the investments have gone in, in the infrastructure, in creating opportunities, a vast social security net. It's all internal resource mobilization. So th we have generated wealth, but at the same time ensured that we create a social security net. We have done so, the biggest ever in human history, in the shortest period of time, where farmers are protected. Every citizen of the country has a constitutional right of 100 days of work and wages. Nobody can refuse, nobody can deny. Wealth is being generated, sustainable employment is created, wealth is being dis redistributed. At the same time, it's true that it is, we have seen the rise of a middle class. Middle class in India today perhaps is close to the population of Europe itself. So you're Did looking they, greater than 200 million. I thought it was in the no, we are looking at We are looking at 400 million at least. By which time frame? At, at this juncture? They already are. Okay. We are a country of 1.1 billion. But if we have the equal number of people who need to be empowered, that's why the emphasis on inclusive growth. So what, what level are we at in terms of per capita income? Because this is where it needs to go to the next level, does it not? Per capita income in India. You see, per capita income has grown fourfold 
but uh, how do we look at it? Because I always look at the gaps. One is you look at the national average. We have perhaps the one of the largest number of billionaires in dollar terms which any other emerging economy would have. We have multinationals which are as big as the true multinationals out of America or Europe. At the same time, we have a middle class which is spending middle class. But when we look at the poor, then they are real poor. It's extreme on both sides. Then. It is extreme, and that is where the resources are going. That is where the priority is, because we are a democracy. In 1950, when we declared ourselves a republic and adopted the constitution, upholding the commitment of the founders of the Indian Republic and the freedom fighters, we gave to India uh, a constitutional democracy and every citizen a right to vote. Our government, the previous one, I was there, a member of that government too, we have given another important right to our people, that's the right to information, which was earlier confined only to members of the legislature. So every citizen today has a right, not only to vote, but also right to information from the government, from any agency, and if it is not given, it's a punishable offense. Okay. I mean, the other thing I would like to bring up here is the challenges that have emerged as a result of all the capital flows that have been moving into emerging markets. We had record flows into the emerging markets in 2010, $825 uh, billion. So that's a blessing because there's a lot of capital, some of it foreign direct investment. The other side of it's very hot money, uh, money Minister. Um, how do you manage this sort of luxury of having the capital coming in or a potential sudden stop with capital flying right out like it did in, in your case uh, in the late 1970s in Latin America? That's right. Well, the good part of the thing is that now the emerging markets, if you see the 1997, uh, the uh, 97 Asian crisis, you know, as it originated in Asia. In the 1980s, the, the debt crisis originated in Latin America. In the current crisis that we uh, just uh, lived last year, we have been part of the solution. And emerging markets have uh, emerged much stronger. And you showed a figure, which is, of course, right, the 34% that emerging markets are in the world economy. That's measured at market exchange rates. But if you measure it at purchasing power parity exchange rates, the figure is 47%. Mm. So we're almost at PPP. We're almost at half, half of the world economy. And it will keep growing, as you showed. And, of course, this, uh, the success here brings some challenges, as you were mentioning. The... Uh, the, the capital inflows that we're experiencing right now is, uh, uh, to some extent, it's a blessing because capital comes to countries where there are opportunities, <coughs> where there are uh, investment, you know, direct investment opportunities in financial investments. But at the same time, it creates a big challenge. Just to give you a case, my own country, Chile, uh, we have a very strong mining sector. In fact, uh, the mining sector is uh, about 17% uh, of our gross domestic product. It's very uh, it's located, concentrated in the north of the country, mostly. And we have agriculture spread out, and we have industry spread out. And when you have big capital inflows, because your, our terms of trade have improved, because the prices of our, the goods we sell are at record highs, but at the same time, it's because we have a, a monetary policy in the U.S., which is very expansionary, including not only record low interest rates, but also quantitative easing. And on the other hand, you, uh, you have the situation of, you know, the main emerging economy, which is China, whose currency doesn't change. And this is not just an issue between the U.S. and China. We are all involved, meaning all of us, those who have market exchange rates, uh, uh, currencies that move according to market forces. So in our case, what do we do? This is not only our case. This is Peru, Colombia. Uh, these are countries in Asia as well, which are experiencing the appreciation trend, uh, South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil. So uh, the first line of defense is to have a responsible fiscal policy. That's part of what we do in the, in the finance ministry. But that's not enough to counteract this, this, uh, sickle, this huge capital flow. The second line is we go to uh, currency intervention in the markets and buying foreign exchange. And uh, many countries have announced foreign exchange intervention are increasing uh, at a fast pace, international reserves, and some have uh, had capital controls. 
you know, in the process. We have not in Chile. We, mm. we think and we have said we won't go that way. But uh, other economies like Brazil have done it, like Israel. Israel also an economy which is having a lot of uh, uh, capital inflows. Does this have to end up in a very nasty way, though, if I can get to the point? If you have that much money floating around the world looking for very quick profits because they're not getting those returns in the United States or in European markets for the very reasons you talked about, are we going to say in 12 months' time this has been a very nasty correction or not? I don't think so. I think that uh, and for, for uh, several reasons. There is a part of this capital inflows which is cyclical, meaning it is because the industrial economies are at very low levels of growth and very uh, low interest rates, so there is a big attraction of coming that kind of capital. Part of that uh, cyclical thing should go when the U.S. economy and Europe, you know, start picking up. So, but there is another part which is more structural. It is because the good investment opportunities are mainly in our economies. So I think the other part which I would mention, although mainly it may be a technical point, is that many emerging economies are issuing international debt in their own currency. And that is a big change. And the reason it is a big change is because in the past, when you had the capital flow reversals, huge devaluations, crisis. Linked now, to the dollar. Linked exposed. to the dollar. Yeah. But, you know, uh, many economies are issuing currency, and there's a lot of appetite in the international markets for emerging market currencies. And those emerging markets who are doing well are issuing bonds. And we had a currency, uh, we had a bond uh, in pesos, in Chilean pesos, oversubscribed 7.3 times in New York last year. And we know there's appetite for more of this. So these are ways in which we can manage. And, of course, the currency intervention is also a way to smooth out uh, uh, you know, the effects of this. I think that you cannot rule out that capital is volatile and that it, it comes and then leaves, but you have to, we have a much stronger base right now, and I think that will uh, uh, help us uh, bear the next round of uh, capital flow reversals. Hmm. Carla, you know, you're a banker. Do you agree with this assessment, or are we going to be uh, crying in our beer in uh, 2012 as a result of all this hot no, money? I, th I, th I think from an emerging market perspective, we are living in a good honeymoon today. But we have to create the institutional bodies there in order that when life comes back to Europe and the United States, the money is not shifted back. The money stays where it is. So I think legal redress, rule of the law, still is an issue in the, when we look at it. I remember actually in 1997 when uh, South, Southeast Asia, when it went off, the best reform from a basically legal perspective and whatever it was in Indonesia. And the most suffering was in Indonesia because the other countries around them were far, far behind. So well, they came out much quicker than Indonesia did. My memory serves me right. So I think it's very important that the emerging markets, they make sure that that institutionalization is there on an ongoing basis. It's got to be solid. It's got to be not to be cracked. And I submit <coughs> chapeau to India. I mean, what India is doing is fairly strong, fairly important. But as the minister said, to create that additional middle class perspective to come through, because if it doesn't, the gap, as Bill Clinton said, is just getting wider and wider and could be a frustration later on. So I think it's all to do with making sure that we have that institutional perspective in these countries you know, that we don't lose the money to go back to the north. Good. The, the, one of the uh, elements we've seen in the Middle East recently it's, is the very high birth rates, of course, with the youth population, about two-thirds of society. So jobless problems in the youth is, of course, percolated to the top. The second side of what we're seeing right now in the Middle East, but also in other markets of the world, particularly India, is uh, food inflation and overall price inflation because of all the growth that you have. Uh, Mari Pangetsu, what are you doing in Indonesia to try to, to contain this, uh, this genie in the bottle? I just wanted to come back on that institutional point. I think the lesson from the 97, 98 crisis was exactly that. You can do all the reforms you want, but if you haven't got the institutions in place, uh, then that's what happens, uh, you know, with the crisis. We had we opened up our banking sector; they were lending excessively, and then you had the crisis because you didn't have the supervision capacity, and you had, you know, not the legal system and so on. So I think that's really important point uh, on the inflation. Uh, the food price inflation hit us last year, and it was in, in our case it was mainly rice uh, prices going up, uh, as well as to some extent wheat prices uh, due to the export restrictions from Russia and Ukraine. So I think uh, the issue here is 
uh, why has the food, pr uh, why has commodity prices gone up? And if you try to understand that, one is the production uh, falls due to climate change effects. In our case, we had a very, basically the whole year we had rain, so very wet uh, uh, harvest and so on, that caused the production to go down and led to the price increases. Now we have, uh, we have uh, imported rice, we've reduced the duties. So, you know, what, what should countries do to respond? I think that's probably the most important, uh, more important question. We learned a lot in 2008 <laughs> from uh, the same experience. The first thing you do is you use your fiscal instrument. You, uh, you, you reduce duties and value added tax on food commodity prices. And if you export the food commodity, then you introduce an export tax. Uh, and we did that uh, with a progressive export tax on our palm oil, which is palm oil uh, is also going up in price. That affects cooking oil uh, domestically. The second thing you do, uh, because pr high prices is uh, still uh, not, it's not possible for you to reduce the price. Uh, if you do, you have to subsidize, and then the finance ministry will just scream at you. You'll have a huge subsidy uh, problem with you. So what you do is you have targeted subsidy. You uh, put more money uh, into the pocket of the poor people, or you compensate. You know, so we have a subsidized rice uh, program. We have cash for work, uh, but it has to be very targeted to the poor. Uh, and the third thing you do is you've got to make sure your production goes up because I think that's really, uh, really the, the, the point. And uh, part of that, I'm going to get to Doha. I'm sorry, I'm, Doha is on my mind. One of the reasons in 2008 uh, we, we learned this lesson, the distorted uh, prices due to the agriculture subsidies and the domestic support has been uh, behind the lack of uh, investment in agriculture as well as in the technologies that go with it. We haven't had a, a agriculture revolu a technology revolution since the Green Revolution in the 70s. And that's what, part of the reason why production has, been, has gone down. So, so me, I think this is really a very important issue. Let me ask Minister Sharma the same thing, though. I mean, uh, I remember having a, a roundtable here five years ago, and they thought that Doha was just around the corner, and it's almost growing moldy because it's 10 years old. I mean, can you really get a deal done by uh, November uh, 2011 on the 10th anniversary or not? Do you want me to respond to the issue of food inflation? Yeah, but maybe I want to address Doha because uh, I will Shanghai come, to, I will that come to that. Uh, I will agree with what Maria has said, because food inflation is the cause of worry. It's not the inflation as such. So it's not the overheating of the economy. If you look at the global scenario, uh, it's the same situation developing what happened in 2008. The world is today remembering, and the economy is recovering from what happened, the economic crisis which followed the financial crisis, which was primarily because of the failure of the regulatory mechanism the exposure of the banks, financial institutions to toxic assets, which didn't, didn't happen in countries like ours. But preceding that, the food crisis, when the food inventories were the lowest since the 1960s, and also the food prices were the highest, there was lack of investment in agriculture and also the diversion of edibles, the diversion of grain for energy, particularly corn, and we were cautioning. Today, while we are discussing other issues and inflation, the fact is that there is a shortage of food, not in our countries, but we have shortage of pulses. We have shortage of palm oil. So when Murray was talking about palm oil prices going up, I was getting more worried sitting here because we take preemptive measures to import at zero duty well in time, both pulses, three to four million tons, nine million tons of edible oil. But when you look at grain, wheat and rice, we have enormous stocks, and uh, we have had bumper crops. That's not an issue. But in the global context, it will be an issue, and the movement of the primary articles and speculative commodity, uh, commodity trading. Plus, the second crisis of 2008 was the energy crisis. Oil prices went up to 137, 140 well, barrels. We're, we're, we're knocking them $100 a barrel no. again. As you a are back to $100. Yeah. And yeah. there are d increasing disparities in many societies, restive young population, lack of opportunities, and therefore this will be a major issue in 2011. It's true that if we put in place a multilateral trade regime, which, is, which corrects the historical distortions, which is rule-based, which is fair, which is equitable, it will help in a big way. We have had a series of meetings, uh, not only today. Today we had a productive ministerial, but with the key stakeholders, uh, I have been talking, Murray has been talking, not only in Davos, but otherwise. 2011 is a window. 
You asked for November. We never talked of November. But 2011 is the window of opportunity which has been uh, stated by the leaders at the G20 summit. Unlike Pittsburgh, London or Toronto, this time they have said clearly reaffirming, accepting the progress which has been recorded. This means the issues which have been settled already. And to further build on that, I feel that there is a will. There is clear signaling of the political intent and the remainder gaps can be closed in a spirit of mutual accommodation and give and take. What I have been urging uh, the key stakeholders in the meeting yesterday and today is that each one of us should be willing to take a step forward and find a comfortable middle ground where everybody, the LDCs, the small and vulnerable economies, as well as developed and developing and emerging, feel comfortable to stand together. They cannot be economy-specific solutions, country-specific solutions. So everybody has to give and up no something. no perfect this solutions. A... So it has, to be, it has to be in a spirit of give and take. If there are demands being made, there has to be reciprocity too. Okay. Let me leave it there, Mr. Lorraine, and then I'll go to Holly tonight. Yes, a couple of points here. Of course, uh, you know, in terms of the Doha round, all the support that we can uh, give, this is uh, a matter that we, we should, you know, be willing to give something, you know, in if we want to have an agreement. So it's not just going and taking. So, I mean, in this spirit. Uh, in terms of the food prices, a couple of issues that, that worry me. The first of all, which has not been mentioned here, is the biofuels mm -hmm. and is the, is the use of food for uh, production of biofuels. There's another part of the biofuels which come from a different way uh, so that doesn't hurt. In, but a part of the increase in the, in the prices, and this is a misguided policy used from, by some countries. I know, should you be unwound and, or can you unwind it? It's, it's, it looks well, like I think we're you can always, a, a misguided policy like this, you can unwind, of course, and, and I would create you know, release pressure from foods. And I would say, and with all due respect, but I, I have a disagreement with the export restrictions in some countries, yeah. because what it happens is that you create an environment where you have uh, lower prices. I mean, suppose we all put export restrictions as part of our policy to address the, food, the increase in food prices. Then we're going to create a big distortion in the world. So targeted subsidies, as it was said, all in agreement. And in, in my particular case, I would say don't meddle with the prices. Don't yeah. try to interfere with the prices. Just try to do away with the restrictions and targeted subsidies to the poor, which is a very important part. Well, I'd I mean, just like to pick on the Doha round and the G20 issue. I mean, the Doha round, I was just listening to Pascal Lamy. He was saying that 80 percent has been agreed upon. We're left with 20 percent. We can do it before end of this year. Now, actually, I will raise this question to both Marie and, and uh, Minister Sharma. Now, this 20 percent, how much is it the poorer guys like us that we have to give in to the bigger guys such as America and Europe? I think that's an important thing. Who has to give more? in this thing and who has to take less in this thing, which my feeling is we have to give more to the developing countries to the developed countries. That's the way it looks. But that's an important thing to think about from who's given to give more and more, less. The G20, there's been a lot of discussion about G20. What do we need? Do we need to have a, some sort of a institutionalized G20? Who should be in G20? Should we have additional members of G20? I have a major problem with it, G7, G8, G20, is that preaching is one thing. And then the rest of the other countries have to basically do things whilst the preachers sit back and don't. And that is something which is really getting bad in this, today's changes that we're having, especially in capital markets, especially in financial sector that we've had. I mean, we are, I mean, I'm not a Sarkozy fan, but uh, I go along with what he said two days ago. Hey, 2008 is not history. It's only two years ago. And who got us where we are? It was basically... Institute, financial institution in the United States, and the rest is history. And we're, we're, look where we are today. We had to, in the emerging markets and developing countries, we had to pay a higher price, much higher price, than actually the developed countries when it came to the financial crisis. And that is an important issue that we basically recognize it rather than just talk about it and preach about it. Okay, quick, very quick question uh, to Mr. Kelly Betov. You uh, have a customs union uh, signed now with Russia and Belarus, for example. Mary Pangas, whose president was just in India doing bilateral trade, who really needs to have a Doha round? How the aspirations, for example, of Kazakhstan to get into the WTO, in retrospect, is it really a priority to get this done or not? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, also because of crisis in Kazakhstan, was a, a lot of re reorientation probably in terms of the capital uh, inflows. Uh, in, if in previous period we brought uh, about 100 billion FDI, mostly from uh, developed country, when one was uh, during the crisis, actually access of Kazakhstani financial sector to 
international Western financial institution was closed because it was overheating all our economy, overlending, and then uh, this refinancing was closed. And uh, we, uh, we start to uh, find out a new source for future uh, development of economy of Kazakhstan. In these terms, you probably know we ge geographically we located between Russia and China, and the close relationship with those countries really help uh, to the country to, to fight crisis. For example, we create a custom union with Russia in Belarus, and uh, that's changed completely the structure of uh, export and import. And with uh, China, we've uh, agreed about the huge credit lines for billion US dollars, and I think uh, that's uh, really help us to think that we probably not part of the um, future economic growth of Eastern Europe, but probably we are uh, part of the uh, close to uh, Chinese economic growth in the future. And I think that's uh, help us uh, a lot from one side. From the other side, uh, if you analyze just from the anti-crisis point of view, uh, China and Russia uh, maybe were more resilient in terms of the crisis uh, suffering rather than other countries. So it means that a lot of countries in different parts of the world uh, now uh, coming back to the regional agenda. And it's, uh, uh, it's a huge shift in, in comparison with previous period. Good, Mari? Yes, I uh, wanted to come three points quickly. Uh, still on the food price inflation, one more factor is the fact that the, this excess liquidity is going, back, uh, going into uh, futures <coughs> commodity markets. This happened in 2008 also, so it's happening again. And that's causing the, the, the price to fluctuate more, the volatility. Uh, second point, uh, in, in the 20 percent of pending issues, uh, definitely least developed countries will not have to give any more at all. Uh, actually, it's the least developed countries that are waiting uh, for the dividends of the development round. Uh, for uh, the, the other developing countries, I would have to say that some of the larger developing countries are, I think, in a position to willing to give more, a little bit more, but in a balanced way. Uh, the other developed countries also have to give more. And it is still very important to conclude Doha despite regional agreements because when we negotiate regional agreements, and we have a number of them already integrating uh, East Asia and ASEAN, you do it based on WTO+. plus. So my argument is that you still need a Doha. You need a WTO that's working and moving and advancing uh, in line with what's happening in the world with trade. You know, you've got to have services in there. You've got to have rules in there. So we, we still definitely need a Doha. Okay, I want to call on another graphic that kind of gives us an indication of what's going to be happening in the next uh, 20 years. Let's look at the top five economies of 2010 uh, in terms of the overall scale of numbers here today. This is quite interesting when you draw it up between 2010 mm -hmm. and uh, 2030. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. is the number one economy at $15 trillion. Uh, China at six, Japan, Germany, and France. Japan at nearly five and a half, Germany at three, and France at $2.6 trillion. Uh, let's go to, to 2030 and take a look. China at $74 trillion in this uh, super cycle discussion that we've had before. The U.S. still growing substantially, going up to 38. Uh, India going from $1.6 trillion today uh, to $30 trillion by the year um, 2030. Brazil at $12 trillion, and then you see Indonesia rounding out the top five at $9 trillion. So a phenomenal shift. I mean, going to the, to the east here and, and the growth and explosion uh, underway. What I'd like to find out is how it changes uh, the makeup of the G20 and the, how it changes the power structure as we see it today. So the IMF and World Bank institutions still dominated by the West. The G7 has evolved quickly because of the financial crisis of the G20. But who's going to call the shots within these structures? How do you see it from as a relatively small country, but the one that yes. plays on the global scene? Yes. Uh, well, I think that this, uh, it has to do, uh, it has to have a big impact in the way these institutions are, are, are managed. Uh, and let me say one thing. I, I, uh, as you all know, the World Bank president is traditionally U.S. national, and, uh, and the IMF uh, director is a European national. And I think there is no reason why this shouldn't be open. If it is a U.S. national or a European national, based on merit, that's great. But I think the, this is one thing that should happen in the future, that perfectly well an emerging market you know, uh, 
person uh, highly qualified could be uh, could preside over these organizations. There is fundamental change already inside these organizations in terms of the voting power, and and this is already happening. And I think it should accommodate a reality that uh, that you're showing there, you know, and and that is already in the cards in 2010, and that uh, will uh, continue shifting that way. So the shift in power and the shift in economic power should be reflected in the international organizations as well. One final point on the on the trade issue. I think that we have all gone uh, in, into these trade agreements. In Chile, for example, we have uh, 21 free trade agreements with 58 countries. And uh, this covers 95% of our exports go to markets with which we have uh, a free, uh, some kind of trade agreement, a comprehensive trade agreement. Uh, this is a response, in a way, to the, uh, you know, to the lag in Doha. You know, we, of course, would like Doha to go ahead because it's a much more efficient way. It's a way in which we open the, uh, the whole world for trade, not only in goods, but in services, in agriculture, etc. But what happens if you don't see that? Well, countries have gone into the logic of trade agreements. And just to give you one figure, in 1990, there were 50, around 50 trade agreements. In 2010, there are 250 trade agreements, bilateral, regional, etc. Good. In the Saudi Arabian case, uh, Mr. Almaty, uh, we have some new agreements being forged on the, in the private sector level and then government to government. For example, Saudi Arabia and China right now. Mm -hmm. Most would think Saudi Arabia always looked west as an ally of the United States. It's got uh, very substantial business dealings with China. That's changed dramatically in the last three or four years alone, even within the SABIC structure. Well, first of all, let me comment on uh, your ranking of, of these countries uh, where the shift is going uh, east. Uh, this is really a linear uh, projection. I, I think there will be balancing. I mean, the West is not going to give up its ranking, you know, just easily. There will be a change. There will be adjustment, a technological adjustment. You can see, you know, when we talk about the global warming and uh, all the technology is going to come from the West and it's going to expand. The, the digital uh, economy is the biggest uh, in the West. So uh, I'm not uh, so sure whether uh, this projection uh, is, is going to hold as, as has been seen. In my country situation, uh, we are a beneficiary of this global shift. Saudi Arabia has expanded uh, its manufacturing. And my company, for example, about 35 years ago was, n was not on the map. And uh, because of this global shift uh, coming for the resource region in Saudi Arabia, my company was started in 1977, and it is diversified into uh, uh, urea, uh, fertil I mean, uh, fertilizers, uh, steel, petrochemical, engineering plastics, and gave us really a level uh, or a critical mass because of uh, our uh, raw material advantage. And this raw material advantage has been acknowledged in our negotiation in WTO, and uh, it gave us really the assets that made us expand our uh, business uh, on a global basis to where we are now number six in the world. And uh, we have manufacturing assets in, in the Americas, in, in China. China is a huge market. Uh, it's a growing population, uh, many urban centers. And so it was natural for uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to connect with China and India through energy. So China now is the biggest uh, energy user uh, from Saudi Arabia. It's taken because the West is cutting down because of global warming, cutting down its uh, oil purchases. And we are a beneficiary of the expansionary uh, economies in, in both uh, in all of emerging markets. 60% in the near term of your oil is going to be going to China to give you an mm. indication of the demand yes. from China. Mr. Kilian Betoff, uh, you sit in between at the, the crossroads of East and West in a sense. You have, uh, you're exporting oil to Western Europe. You've got a pipeline to Russia. You've established pipeline agreements to China. Geopolitically, how do you balance this out? Because uh, this shift to the East includes a tug of war for your assets, which are highly prized, not just in the energy sector. Um, so from the beginning, you probably know Kazakhstan brought a lot of uh, uh, American and European companies, companies from the Middle East, so they work very actively. But the last time, uh, the China became is more active. And I agree 
with my pre previous uh, colleague that uh, China maybe even use the uh, crisis time. So in order to dominate in, in this sector, we've seen it in different <laughs> countries in Africa, in Central Asia. Uh, for example, in Central Asia, in Turkmenistan, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, we bought a lot of uh, oil and gas fields. And I think this is uh, also a new tendency when the emerging market countries like uh, uh, China, Ra uh, Russia, and India, they really competing with uh, major oil and gas companies. And we... Uh, trying to manage it uh, appropriate way, so in order to uh, geopolitically maybe not uh, damage the interest of the country in, in these terms. So we have uh, uh, diversification policy. So you mentioned absolutely right away. We have gas and oil pipeline in different directions. So we support the Caspian transit. We have a pipeline uh, through uh, Russia uh, Federation. We have a pipeline uh, in direction of China. And so I think we will be smart enough to manage it right away. Good. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is uh, the importance of managing this, uh, this hunt by China for natural resources around the world. It was referred to by uh, Mr. Ahmadi. Uh, India in, has had to compete against China in different aspects going after natural resources. Do they need to be counterbalanced here? Are we going to wake up in 10 years' time and say, well, I can't believe we let China do as much as it did in the span of 10 to 15 years? Minister Sharma? You see, energy security and need of <clears throat> natural resources, whether minerals, metals, is a must. There are regions of the world which are resource-rich, whether it's the entire African continent, South Americas, Central Asia. It's not that China itself does not have resources. It depends on what resources you need for your development. India also has vast natural resources, but we have shortage of oil and gas. Having said that, we have made some major finds of gas, some of the biggest in the world recently, like Brazil has made. Gas finds have been in India. Onshore oil finds have been in India too. But our demand, the pace at which the economy is expanding, far outstrips the supplies that we have. So therefore, we have to ensure that we access every source of energy. The issue is that we are not competing with China. We are looking at our own needs. India has a historic uh, relationship with the countries of the South, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. Our nature of engagement is different. We are going there, we are in investing in value addition, human resources, creating institutions, training their people. Indian companies are investing, generating employment. We, don't we are not sending our people for employment, or we are not bringing back resources. But when it comes to oil and gas, that will continue. The dependence on fossil fuels eventually will go down. It's not only these two, but coal. So therefore, we have consciously embarked on a path of diversification of our energy basket. We are developing all sources, major emphasis on renewables. Perhaps one of the world's biggest solar uh, project has been kick-started by India. Okay, Mr. Sharma, I just need to have you no, wrap wait. up your thought because I need to take some mm -hmm. questions, please. Sure. Okay, very right. good. You have some questions from the audience here and some of the, the things that we brought up in terms of the, the global shift. Minister Pat, guess you, I think it seemed something in, in Washington that's taking place, and I'm going to see if you can give us a very candid answer about it, and that is uh, Washington engaging with India, Washington engaging with Indonesia, and many see it as a triangle to make sure they counterbalance the growth and power of China. How do you see this relationship forming, this triangle between the, that's what Washington's establishing? <laughs> well, uh, I think it's always this balance of uh, trying to balance the power. But I think emerging markets in general, uh, rising economic power also means rising responsibility. And uh, this year, for the first time in the East Asia Summit, we're actually inviting the U.S. and Russia. So I think we've come full circle on that one. <laughs> so you're willing to, to share power. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Sharma. Well, I think uh, sovereign countries make their own national policies, foreign and security. India makes its own. As far as we are concerned, we want a balance. We have been clearly working for a multipolar world order, a new political architecture in the world, a new economic architecture, which is reflective of the contemporary global realities. U.S. is a strategic partner for, for India, and it's bound to be uh, because we are two largest democracies on this planet. At the same time, we have a strategic relationship with China, too, with Indonesia, too, with Russia, with France. 
So countries are engaging with each other. It's bound to be that emerging countries, major countries will reorder uh, the relationships to ensure that there is a balance. Now, you are, what your question was purely from the perspective of Washington. But this is now how the rest look at the global scenario. The, we'd have no intention to contain China. We have a cooperative relationship because this century belongs to Asia. This century will see in the next 20 years, if not 15 years, that the Asian economies, the GDP, will be more than the G7 industrialized countries. So that is a reality of life. It's no, not a question of conflict. It's a question of cooperation. It's a question <coughs> of working together. Good. Mr. Kelly, Betsoff, and then Mr. Janai, very quickly, we have a question from the floor. Just a second, please. I also would like to confirm, Minister Sharma, uh, uh, the cooperation in Asia among uh, the cooperation between BRIC countries became stronger and stronger. So we have a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which includes China, Russia, and Central Asia countries, and India and Pakistan uh, are observers over there. And this is not only about security cooperation, this is cooperation about uh, uh, economic uh, uh, terms. And I think uh, China and uh, uh, and, uh, and India will need more oil and gas, uh, more uranium, more mining, and in these terms, Russia and Central Asia could really cooperate in this issue. Good. We're going to hear a lot more, I would imagine, about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as this, this world tilts east, right, in terms of the power. You have the chairmanship this year. Mr. Janahi? Well, I'd, I'd just like to go back to, the, to bring it together from that perspective, go back to your first question about Egypt and what lessons are we learning. I think we've been so far, so, so many years, we've been missing basically every time we have a wake-up call, we miss it out. But this time, there is a major, major wake-up call at us. Number one, what's happening around us in Egypt and Tunis and elsewhere. I think we have to have, and what we're just listening here, at the end of the day, we have to look after ourselves while looking after everybody else. So regional integration, opening up trade in the Middle East is a must. I and mean, we are proving what's happened over the past two weeks, that we are, we are one body, whether we are Tunisians, we are Egyptians, we are Moroccans, we are Bahrainis, we are Gath, we are all one body. So we have to have regional integration in order that we can compete with the rest of the world. I mean, as Mr. Sharma said, they are the largest democracy in the world. Hey, it would be nice to have 300 million people, more than America, as the second largest democracy in the world. So I think it's very important to have that regional integration. Mm. I think just looking at your graph that we had 2010, 2000. 30, I would like to do 2010, 2015 Middle East. I think Hamad al-Mahdi was very good in his answer, but let me now add it to you in terms of where do we go and learn a good lesson. Nepotism in 2010, no nepotism in 2015. No meritocracy in 2010, full meritocracy in 2015. No accountability in 2010, full accountability in 2015. I think just those three alone will take us a long way, us as a Middle Easterns, to the way forward. Because if we don't do that, we'll be sitting back, and as Mr. Sharma said again, the fossil fuel will not be required in 20 or 30 years down the road or 40 years down the road. So we've got to look into the future for our people. In fact, there's a glo uh, greater Arab free trade agreement that's on the table, but not really been uh, yeah. s followed in this greatest spirit. A question here? Um, Hugo Xiong from uh, IDG. <laughs> Uh, China. Maybe I'm probably the only Chinese here because you talk about uh, China a lot. Um, I'm, I like to think, uh, ask each of you what do you feel China is a competitor or partner for the market space of Middle East? The reason I ask this question is I think uh, the positioning of the relationship with China is very important because during the recent uh, visit by Hu Jintao to uh, the U.S., redefined the U.S.-China relationship as the uh, economic partnership under the basis of mutual benefit and the mutual respect. And uh, so I want to ask your opinion about this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kelly, uh, you want to In terms of Kazakhstan, definitely China is the biggest partner in the future, and I think we will play a uh, servicing role to the Chinese growth like uh, Canada is a servicing economy to the United States. So in Central Asia countries and even Russia will play service role because we will be huge growth of China in the future and partnership relationship is the uh, main agenda of our cooperation. Good. I'd like to get the, the Minister of Chile to, to comment, Mr. Lorraine. It's interesting. China has gone into Latin America in a very, very large way in the last two years. New strategic partner that's uh, 
going into Brazil, going into Chile, looking for resources? Absolutely. And uh, we must say that uh, 10 years ago, uh, China was, uh, you know, barely among the top 10 uh, of our trading partners and today is by far the main trading partner for Chile. You know, so we're, we're a small country, but, you know, about 25 percent of our exports are going to China. And 10 years ago, the U.S. was our main trading partner. So today we are a complete, uh, you know, engaged, and this is happening all over in Latin America, you know, that a, a large part of our exports are going to Asia and are going to China. So we believe we are much more, you know, we are complementary. We provide, you know, natural resources and other things as well, but we're very strong in natural resources and we are feeling the demand from Asia, from China, from India and other countries as well. It's a different situation, I would say, in some countries in Central America and Mexico because there is more competition for the market in the U.S. And so you have to, Latin America is not completely homogeneous in this point, but in general, I would say in the overall majority, we have a big complementary relation with uh, China. Okay, Mr. Almarin, then we'll, we'll wrap the panel. In our case, it is really uh, a complementary relationship. It is a, at a strategic level. It is evidenced by the Chinese president, he visited Saudi Arabia three times in less than five years. And uh, because we have the raw materials and China has the market, so we, there isn't much of a competition. It is really an uh, integration of the two economies. Okay. Uh, Minister Pangetsu, if I could just ask you, do you have any fears? I heard somebody say in a panel this afternoon that we're going to live in this extraordinary period of the next 10, 20 years with no conflict, and we're just going to ride this wave in the super cycle to 2030. What is your biggest fear as you see the, the shape of the world today and this tilt to the east and the influence and tensions it may create as a result of this power moving to the east? I think the uh, pressures on population, uh, on food, energy, and water, I think that's probably my, one of my biggest fears. So you may have an economic war for resources if we don't manage it right. Uh, I think the second issue would be managing the tensions. I think some uh, comments here were made about uh, the rise of China and how we deal with it. I think that will still be, be an issue. Uh, an issue in the sense, how do you, is it competition or uh, co cooperation? It's, it's both. And uh, managing that right, uh, I think, is going to be, in, in Asia especially, a very key uh, answer to that. We are already integrated. Uh, how do we make it uh, a win-win partnership and, and not uh, one or the other? And at, at the end of the, of the day, you're going to have a very uh, fragmented supply chain that connects us all in the production of goods services. And uh, I think the third uh, fear uh, is uh, the fear of uh, in lack of inclusiveness. Uh, and the social tensions that that would lead to. And, you know, I think what's happening, uh, I think, in the Middle East is, is a, a, a testimony of that. So I think we all have to make sure that we have the right set of policies to deal with inclusiveness. Okay, thanks very much. Let's give a nice round of applause to our panelists. Of course. And uh, just a reminder, you can see this on uh, CNN Marketplace Middle East Friday,